My name's uh, Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute here at WSU. And on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out to our lecture this evening, uh, which will be given by Andrew Zimbalist. Uh, before I introduce our guest and our topic tonight, though, I just want to make you aware of our next Foley event. It will be held uh, next Wednesday, April 3rd. At 10.15, we have Governor Jay Ensley, who will be speaking about uh, clean energy in the state of Washington. That's going to be in the uh, Bryan Auditorium, so put that on your calendars. Uh, for tonight's lecture, we couldn't really have a topic that's more topical and more timely than uh, uh, talking about money in college athletics. Uh, many of you probably know that we had a special regents meeting today to add half a million dollars to the athletics department's uh, fiscal budget this year in order to hire a new basketball coach, which was announced today as well. So uh, this is front page news and uh, has been occupying uh, the time of a lot of folks at, the, at WSU recently. Uh, college sports currently is a billion dollar industry. Universities spend hundreds of millions of dollars to build bigger stadiums and better athletic facilities. Coaches are the highest paid public employees in nearly every state. Television contracts are driving conference alliances and decisions about college athletics across our country. At the same time, student athletes aren't paid. Student fees to pay for athletic facilities and events have skyrocketed. And most universities that have major athletics programs go into debt to fund those programs. So the question is, is this model of financing collegiate sports sustainable? And we have no better uh, person to speak to that question than Andrew Zimbalist. Dr. Zimbalist is the Robert A. Woods Professor and the Chair of the Economics Department at Smith College, where he has taught since 1974. He received his BA from the University of Wisconsin and an MA and a PhD in Economics from Harvard University. He's been a visiting professor at Doshisha University in Japan, the University of Geneva, and Hamburg University. In addition to consulting for the United Nations and the U.S. Agency for International Development, Professor Zimbalist has for many years consulted the sports industry including players associations, cities, companies, teams, and leagues. In addition to his numerous articles in scholarly journals and more popular outlets, he is the author of 28 books, including Baseball and Billions, Sports, Jobs, and Taxes, Unpaid Professionals, Commercialism and Conflict in Big-Time College Sports, Equal Pay, Title IX and Social Change, The International Handbook on the Economics of Mega Sport Events, and his, one of his more recent books is entitled Unwinding Madness, What Went Wrong with College Sports and How to Fix It, which was published just a year ago. Join me now in welcoming Professor Andrew Zimbalist to Washington State. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Cornell, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm, I'm told that I have about 45 minutes for my initial remarks, and what I'd like to do fundamentally is, is first of all, to try to give you a description of the parameters of the, the economic crisis that I think confronts college sports, uh, and then to move to the question of what can be done about it. And I think, uh, just, just to anticipate, it's very hard to do anything effective at, at the level of an individual school. In my view, it's something that has to be done systemically. That is to say, it has to be part of a national <clears throat> set of public policies. Although I'll be concentrating on financial and economic matters, I don't want to ignore the fact that the crisis, at least in my view, extends well beyond uh, dollars and cents. <clears throat> there have been, in, in the last year, and, and if we were here a year ago, I would have a set of different events that I can refer to, but there have been a number of scandals. They, they come out of college sports on a regular basis. Uh, in my view, one of, one of the most horrific things that happened over the last year was the death of, of a Maryland football player uh, during summer practices. He, he was made to run 10, 110 yard sprints in, in uh, the heat of, the heat of uh, Maryland in June, uh, and he died from that. <clears throat> and late, later it was discovered that the coach was following practices to, uh, to push the players beyond their, their physical limits. There was, um, about a year ago, a study, not a study, but uh, a suit that was brought forward by the FBI that they had identified a network, <coughs> excuse me, and this is a network of, of something that we've known about for decades and decades, but it's now 
just getting the, the kind of publicity it deserves, a network of uh, coaches and street agents and players and player families, coaches at the high school level, coaches at the college level, and apparel and shoe companies that were paying athletes off from, from their high school years in order to channel them to certain programs that either supported Nike or Adidas or Under Armour. Um, there have been numerous admission scandals. There was a big academic scandal at, at UNC, one of the top academic schools in the nation. Uh, and we, we have a number of instances where coaches are defending players and programs are defending players who have been accused of, of physical violence and, and abusive sexual behavior uh, towards women. Uh, this, this happened, for instance, with Jemais uh, Winston, who was a, a starting star quarterback at, at Florida State. Anyway, the list goes on and on. Uh, I, I didn't want to proceed talking about dollars and cents without first acknowledging those issues. So, in, in broad strokes, the last NCAA study on finances and college sports found that at FBS, at the football bowl subdivision, the top 129 schools in the country that the Pac-12 schools are a part of, for all of those FBS schools, there was a median operating deficit of $14.4 million in their athletic programs. Approximately, in any given year, 20, 21, 22, programs report that they have an operating surplus. They're not having a deficit, but they have an operating surplus. 20 or 21 or two such programs. The reality is that the reporting of operating surpluses is misleading because in, in many, many cases, it includes only a share of the capital costs. It won't include the whole debt service on a stadium or the whole debt service on a training center or on an arena. Uh, because the university will take some of that debt service and put it on the central budget, or sometimes the debt service is put on, on the, the state budget. And there's also a lot of uh, indirect costs that are not attributed to, to athletics. So that we know, for instance, that at uh, FBS schools, at Power Five schools, college administrators, whether it's a college president, a college provost, uh, or other administrators spend a great deal of their time on athletics. Their salary, or part of their salary, if they spend 10% of their time on athletics, 10% of their salary is not attributed to athletics. 10% of the rent in the building that they occupy or the administrative assistance that they have is not attributed to, to athletics. So these numbers are $14.4 million and only uh, 20 schools showing an operating surplus. I think that they uh, are considerable understatements of the, the true dimensions of, of the problem at hand. Uh, there, was a, there was a study that the, that the NCAA commissioned a few years ago uh, to look at as closely as possible what the real operating, excuse me, what the real capital costs were at a typical FBS institution. And that study concluded there was somewhere between 20 and 25 million dollars a year. That would be added on to a typical deficit uh, that, that the NCAA publishes. So the question is, or one question is, how come? What's going on? We know that college sports is enormously popular. Uh, you know that football is enormously popular here at Washington State University. We all know that the final, <coughs> the Sweet 16 is, is happening and there are games that most of us will probably w be watching, at least parts of tonight on television. Um, so college sports generates an enormous amount of money. How could it be the case that these programs are, are running deficits and median deficits of over $14 million, especially since we know that the athletes are not paid. You, you tell any NFL owner uh, that he doesn't, he doesn't have to pay the, the 40, 45 players on his active roster and ask him what would happen to his profits. Uh, obviously, they would skyrocket because the NFL spends approximately 50% of their revenue paying players. In college sports, as you know, the players get at least it, uh, in, in men's basketball and, and in football, which are the, the true revenue generating sports, um, that the players get scholarships. They get grants and aid uh, that cover the tuition room and board and fees. And they also cover uh, maybe $2,000 to $5,000 above that, depending on the school and what are called cost, cost of attendance allowances. But that's all they get. Uh, so you have, you have quarterbacks and you have uh, star halfbacks and star defensive backs on, on teams that generate $150 million a year in college football, um, who are getting scholarships plus some, some subsidies for cost of attendance, 
uh, scholarships that might be worth 50,000, 60, 70, even $80,000, but they're probably generating value in, well in excess of a million dollars. Uh, and so uh, how come when, when we're not paying the athletes, you still have athletic departments generating these very large and, and troublesome deficits? Well, I think the, the, the simplest and most direct answer is that college athletic programs don't run and are not run like normal companies in the United States. A normal company in the United States is trying to maximize its profits. It's trying to do that uh, either for the owner who wants to become wealthier or it's, he, they're, they're doing that because um, they have stockholders and the stockholders want the corporation to report quarterly profits so this, the value of the stock will go up or they want there to be enough money there to pay dividends. Uh, and in an environment like that, there's pressure always to, to save on costs. And when revenues go up, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to find some place to, to, sp to spend the revenue. College sports departments don't have that, that uh, institutional structure. College sports de uh, departments don't have stockholders who want to see profits. What they have is shareholders. They have students who are shareholders. Uh, uh, they, they, have, uh, they have boosters in the town. Um, they have others who want the school to do well. They're not looking for profits, they're looking for victories. And that's the primary pressure that falls upon the athletic director at any, in any college program. They want victories, they want wins. Indeed, the athletic director's future will depend upon the success of his future, how much he earns at the school he's at, or whether he gets to go to a, a higher rank school and earn more. All that will depend upon whether or not he can generate a winning team, or in a few cases, she. There are a couple of female, uh, female athletic directors in, in Division I. Uh, and so when they see more television revenue coming in, or they see maybe more corporate sponsorship money coming in, or more donations coming in, they don't let it fall to the bottom line so that there are profits that can be distributed to shareholders. They're, can think, they're thinking about their stakeholders, not their shareholders, their stakeholders. The stakeholders want to see victories. And so they find, they find ways to spend it. There's always a new stadium that can be built or an old stadium that can be renovated or a new arena that can be renovated, an old arena that can be renovated or a locker room that could be made into a Taj Mahal of locker rooms uh, or nicer hotels that you can uh, have, have the basketball team and football team stay in when, when the team's on the road. All of these ways of spending money are ways in which you attract athletes to your school. You, you, you go to the best high school players in the country and you say, come to my school. How do you convince them? You spend money on coaches, you spend money on stadiums, you spend money on locker rooms, you spend money on all of these accoutrements of the program that are appealing to athletes because you can't, play, but you can't pay them. In a normal market, of course, what would happen is you'd offer, you'd try to get your, the, the individual you're, you're courting, you try to get that person to come to your program by offering them more money. Uh, but you're not allowed to do that in college sports. Now, another interesting feature that accounts, helps account for the, the deficits is the, the uh, presence of cross-subsidies. So when I talk about a deficit of $14 million in the average program, we're talking about the entirety of the athletics department. So here, here at Washington State University, I believe you have 17 sports teams. Uh, probably around half of those are women's teams, half of them are men's teams. And now what happens is that even when it's the case that a school has a successful either men's basketball or football team, and that team generates an operating surplus, that operating surplus then goes to fund other sports. Typical budgets for other sports, even sports that aren't very popular, that you, you can't really sell tickets to, typical budgets might be $300,000 or $500,000 a year or more. So you have cross subsidies that, eats, that eat up any profits that might be produced by uh, by particular teams. Now, one of the things that, that I alluded to a moment ago was paying, paying coaches a lot of money uh, so that you can attract the right coaches, the best coaches to attract, in turn, to attract the best high school players. If you're a great high school football player, there's a really good chance you want to play for Nick Saban in Alabama. And, and, and there's a pecking order that goes, goes down from there. 
in, in order to get the, the top coaches, and a school needs to have the top coaches if they're gonna get the top recruits, and they need the top recruits if they're gonna win, you, you get into a cycle. In order to get the top coaches, you have to compete against the other schools and what they're offering. Uh, so if, if um, uh, the administrators of the athletics program here at WSU say, well, the reason we're paying our coach a base salary in football of $4 million a year um, is because that's the market rate for the football coach, that's correct. Uh, that's exactly correct. If they wanted to get a top coach, they have to pay a top coach salary. That's the way the market operates. In, in, in the FBS, every single, excuse me, in the Power Five, all 65 programs are paying a base salary to their head football coach of over $1.1 million. The average football coach has a base salary of $3.3 million. 20 coaches have salaries over $4 million, and three coaches have salaries over $7 million. Uh, and as the, coach, the head coaches get paid more and more, so do the assistant coaches. Uh, at Alabama uh, this, and, and at Ohio State, the assistant coaches as a group are paid more than $7 million a year. Uh, so what, what be, besides the, the competitive pressure that the schools are under to pay the coaches this kind of money, what else can we understand about that? Why, why is it that the market is generating these kinds of numbers? Well, first of all, it's an artificial market. It's an artificial market because they're operating in an environment where the producers, that is to say the players, the athletes, are not being paid. And so what in effect is happening is that the coaches who recruit the athletes are getting paid for the value that the athletes create. And, and not only is it an artificial market in the sense that the coaches, excuse me, that the players are not being paid, but it's artificial as well because there are a variety of subsidies that are going to bolster and support the program. So there are subsidies from the university uh, that account for the, deficits, the deficit that is being run. There are often subsidies from the, the state that are building the stadiums and the facilities that are being used and so on. So this is not a typical market. It is a market salary that they're getting, but it's an artificial market. Now, how do we know that the salaries are, are crazy salaries? Not just because the numbers are high, but we can run some tests. We can run some mental exercises to think about the level of these salaries. And one of, the one of the things you'll find is if you look at the top 32 salaries that are paid to FBS coaches in college football, they come very, very close to the 32 salaries that are paid to NFL head coaches. Now how could it be the case that a football program in college that might generate somewhere between $50 million and $150 million a year, how could it be the case that uh, the head of that program is being paid the same as an NFL coach when those teams are generating between 300 and 500 million dollars a year. So they're generating three or four times as much re revenue, but the head coach nonetheless is earning the same amount. In economics, we have a theory uh, called marginal revenue product theory that says in competitive markets, workers will be paid up to their marginal revenue product. The marginal revenue product of coaches in college football can't be the same as it is in, in the NFL. Bear Bryant, the famous coach of, of Alabama many years back in the 70s, and maybe it was the 60s and 70s, um, he was one of the most successful coaches in, in college football history. He had a rule, it's come to be known, the Bear Bryant rule. And his rule was that he refused to be paid more than one dollar less what the college president was being paid on the grounds that it was unseemly, that the college was supposed to be an educational institution and therefore it was in, improper to have the football coach paid more than the top academic officer, uh, the, the, either the provost or the, or the president of the university. Uh, and there's another mental exercise I would ask you to think about. In economics, we have something called rent, economic rent. And rent is the money that goes to a factor of production, or an, in, an input in production, over and above what you would have to pay that factor of production to get them to commit to doing that particular work. And so think about it. College coaches, college football coaches, college basketball coaches, uh, most of them have either Bachelor of Arts degrees or Master of Arts degrees. Very few have degrees higher than that. If they couldn't coach FBS football or Division I basketball, what would, they, what would their, their next best alternative be in their life? Well, maybe they'd go down to Division II or Division III, or maybe they'd coach in high school. 
Uh, but they, maybe they'd be earning $200,000 if they went to Division II, or if they went to Division III, maybe they'd be earning sixty dollars or $70,000. In other words, it's, it's folly to think that in a rational world that you would have to pay these coaches $4 million or $7 million, or some of them get $10 million. You'd have to pay them that kind of money to convince them to allocate their labor skills to the, the job of coaching. In fact, I would submit to you that if, if we had a rule that said, if, if Washington passed a law that said you can't pay college coaches more than, more than the college president, or maybe they set a number, say it was, for argument's sake, $500,000. How many college coaches would find a job that paid them more than $500,000? Not, not very many. A few might go up to the NBA or the NFL. But if they did, they'd be replacing somebody up there who'd come down and coach at the college level. In other words, we, we could have a public policy that restricted coaches' salaries, coaches' remuneration, and substantially restricted it, and therefore saved a lot of money for the schools, and not impact at all the level of skill of the coaches that we, we, we retained in college football. We can get the same level of coaching proficiency with a 500,000, that's an arbitrary number, but I'm, maybe it's be 600, maybe it'd be $400,000. Uh, this is a chart that maybe some of you have seen. Uh, I like it a lot. All, all of the uh, yellow and, and orange states uh, are, are examples of states where the head football or the head basketball coach is paid more than anybody else in, in the state, any, any other public official <clears throat> in the state. And of course, in some states, you're not, you're not talking about somebody who's getting paid $10 more than the governor or $1,000 more than the governor or even a million dollars more than the governor. You're talking about somebody who's getting paid several million dollars more than the governor. In Washington, um, ex yeah, in Washington, uh, Governor Inslee, is, he has a salary of $172,000 a year. You have a coach here that, whose base salary, I believe, is $4 million, and another one as of today who will be getting $1.4 million. So these are large differences that exist. Another thing that's true about college sports is that there is specialized tax treatment for, uh, for college programs. Uh, th there are a number of things that I could describe to you, but let me, because I'm, I'm, I don't have a lot of time and I want to move on to how we're going to solve the problem, but let me just point out two things that I think are very important about taxes. In the 2017 tax reform, two very important benefits, tax benefits for college sports were taken away. Um, until January of, ja January of 2018, when a booster, when somebody who was supporting a, a, a college team uh, and making a large donation to the college, and the college in return for that donation would enable the booster to buy, say, football seats on the 50-yard line or basketball seats at center court, that those donations, even though they were indirectly payments to get these great seats at sporting events, those donations were 80% deductible from somebody's taxes, tax deductible. Um, and so it encouraged them t tremendously. Uh, college college uh, sports programs, FBS sports programs, get something like 23% of all of their revenue from donations. That, low, that percentage is lower here. It's closer to 14%, I think. Um, but there's still, it's a very important source. And now it's going to be greatly attenuated, greatly reduced, because people aren't going to get the tax benefit from it anymore. And there was another tax change which imposed a 21% excise tax on payments to anybody uh, in college sports programs that get paid, and in fact, anybody that, in any, any place in the university at all who gets a salary more than a million dollars. So if you have a coach who's getting paid uh, seven million dollars, that's six million dollars above the, the one million dollar threshold. You get a 21% tax, or approximately 1.3 million dollar tax on that. That's something else that's new. It might, there are some ways in which you can maneuver around that or reduce it, but that's a new tax that's going to be falling on, on programs. Uh, so what, are, what does a typical FBS program do in light of, of these circumstances? That the circumstances being the median program has this major deficit, $14 million plus. 
Uh, and they've got some problems on the tax end, and as I'll discuss in a moment, they're going to have a lot of problems on the, on the player end, on the labor end also, because there's all sorts of pressure, political and legal pressure, to, to loosen the constraints on that as well. So what does a program do? One of the things they can do, and I, I understand this is something that you've all experienced here, is they can increase student athletic fees. Uh, some programs or some schools are charging over $1,000 a year for student athletic fees. Uh, they can reduce aid to financial aid to uh, financially needy students. They can decrease the educational budget or the academic budget at the school. Um, they can and some will have to drop non-revenue men's sports and women's sports. So the 17 sports that are currently existing at WSU, some of them might be dropped three or four years down the road and that will be what would be one way of dealing with the, the growing financial pressures. Uh, or they can opt out of the, the competitive arms race in, in college sports. They can simply say, okay, this game is leading us nowhere good. Uh, we, we're running $8 million deficits and they're just going to get larger. So uh, we're going to do what the University of Chicago did uh, and, and concentrate our resources on, on, the on the academic side of things. Uh, so I mentioned just a second ago about labor pressure, labor cost pressure. Uh, not surprisingly, in, uh, given, given the reality, which is that some of these programs are, are generating tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, and the athletes are getting scholarships that might be worth fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars dollars $70,000, there's been a movement amongst the athletes and amongst many others to change the situation. Uh, Senator Murphy from con uh, Connecticut it just, just came out with a report where he's talking about introducing a bill that would mandate pay for athletes. Uh, but in addition to the political pressure, uh, there's been a lot of litigation, antitrust litigation against the NCAA. And the first prominent one uh, was from Jason White, who was an athlete at Stanford. Uh, and he, he was going after the cost of attendance stipend. Uh, the argument was that a, a, a typical kid who's playing college sports, uh, if they're coming from a low-income background, can't really afford to, to come to the college just on the basis of tuition, tuition fees, room, and board. Why? Well, because they have to travel back and forth from their home to the school, uh, because they have clothes that they have to buy, and sometimes a coach will require the team to uh, go around in a sports jacket. There'll be a number of other expenses. And the White case was the first one that brought this forward and said, why is the NCAA imposing a limit that doesn't allow cost of attendance to be covered? And in fact, they did for a period in the 1950s. They did allow cost of attendance to be covered. Uh, that's, that's, that case was settled out of court. It didn't create too many ripples. Uh, for the economics of college sports. But following that, there was another case, many of you probably heard of it, the O'Bannon case, uh, where he was looking for both cost of attendance stipends and the plaintiffs were looking for what are called nils or names, images, and likeness payments. That is to say, when an, when an athlete is used when an athlete is used in a video game, and this was being done with, with Oban Ed O'Bannon, who was a basketball player at UCLA, he discovered, because a friend of his noticed, that they had made a video game. They, they, the, the NCAA had signed up with EA Sports uh, that produced a video game that was being sold in the marketplace that had the championship basketball game the year that Ed O'Bannon was a senior in the, game, in, in the video game. And he, they had never come to Ed O'Bannon and said, can I use your image? Can, I, can we use your name, image, and likeness in this game. They never came to him, much less did they offer to, offer to pay him any money. Anyway, there was a suit about that, uh, and at, at the district court level, it was, this was in Oakland, California, district court level, uh, Judge Claudia Wilkin uh, basically said that athletes should be able to get, there were some constraints, but she basically said college athletes should be able to get nil money, uh, as well as cost of attendance stipends. That was shot down at the appeals level, but what wasn't shot down was the cost of attendance factor. Uh, so what's happening now throughout FBS is that schools are offering, as part of their scholarship offer, they're offering cost of attendance. And again, that could be an extra $2,000 to $5,000 per student. Uh, I believe that the figure that I've, I've seen for WSU is uh, add, it's, that it's adding about $800,000 to the athletics budget. Um, just last week, uh, there was another decision by Claudia Wilkin in a new, in a new case uh, that's known as the Alston and Jenkins case, where they were, they were asking not just for nil payments, not just for name, image, and likeness payments, but they were just asking for an open labor market. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details. We can later if you'd like. Uh, but they basically said, let's create a labor market like they have in the NFL, where teams bid, or schools in this case, bid against each other to get, to get high school players. Um, 
that case, it seems like it's going to res be resolved in favor of more educational stipends uh, that can run ten tens of thousands of dollars in some cases, and perhaps also some more bonuses for, for college players. Uh, and on top of that, some of you might know that several years ago, the, the football players at Northwestern tried to unionize. Uh, the, the National Labor Relations Board in Chicago said, yes, you guys are employees, you can unionize. That was shot down at the federal level, but it was shot down with, with, with caution because the, the people at the federal level said, for now, we think it would be too disruptive to allow these guys to unionize, but they have a point, basically, is where that stands. Uh, and, and so they're, they're willing to entertain that in the future. <clears throat> but the National Labor Relations Board in Washington said they would rather see public public policy or national legislation to deal with the issue rather than having it uh, dealt with by the labor board. <clears throat> and of course, there was a famous case a couple of years ago in Missouri where uh, the, the, the students were protesting some, uh, what, what they believed was race, racist commentary by the college president. And they were asking for the, they thought it was so egregious and they were asking for the college president to step down. And nothing was happening, nothing was happening, and finally the football team said that they, were gonna play, they weren't going to play football on Saturday unless the president stepped down. And the president stepped down. So there, there's, there's a lot of evidence out there that there's, there's ferment and there's activity and there's organization, whether it be political or whether it, whether, whether it be legal, that is, is pushing costs up and pushing them up significantly. And we don't, we don't know really, we don't know really where, it, where, it all, where, where it all ends. The NCAA has made some responses, tepid responses, to this pressure. <clears throat> One of them is that they uh, allowed the, the, the Power Five conferences, they're now called autonomous, the autonomous conferences, they allowed them to set their own policies with regard to defining scholarship limits. And so one of the things that happens is happening now, as I suggested before, is that the COA or the cost of attendance allowance is, is allowed throughout, throughout the Power Five and in, in fact just about universally throughout, throughout FBS. Another thing that the NCA has done is to allow schools to have special dining tables or training tables for the athletes so that the athletes are not restricted to particular hours during the three meals of the day when they can eat, but basically there's a kitchen available 24-7 with dietitians and chefs and, and so on. That raises costs very significantly as well. And the, the NCA has also voted to allow multi-year scholarships. Back in 1972, the NCA passed a rule that said you couldn't give an athlete more than uh, one year at a time as a scholarship. And that gave the coach, each coach, greater flexibility. So a coach could recruit a high school player. You don't really know how good a high school player is going to be because they're not up against great competition. Uh, you can recruit a player. In the old days, you can recruit a player, give him one-year scholarship, and then the coach can push him away and retain his scholarship. In football, as you know, F in FBS football, you get 85 scholarships. Uh, so the, the, the system worked to the benefit and the flexibility of the coaches. And um, what, what they did uh, in, in 2015 is to reintroduce a multi-year scholarship. Uh, and this is something that is certainly good for the players. It was something the players were pressuring for, but it's also something that uh, lowers the flexibility and can raise the costs of, of athletic programs. All right, all of that is, is background by way of saying that's, that's where we're at. That's, that's, that's the dilemma that, that colleges are, are facing. Uh, I think there are out there two broad notions about how to reform the system. One of them is pay for play, uh, creating some kind of a market where you, you, you pay the players. Uh, and another is to reinforce different ways in which you can reinforce the academic mission at the same time that you lower the costs of, of college sports. So I want to talk about each of those in turn. I am not in favor of pay for play for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a misnomer because athletes are already paid. Back when the NCAA was formed in, two, in 1905, uh, the position then was we're, we're amateurs, our students are amateurs, and they cannot receive any compensation for playing. And compensation included compensation in, in kind. So you weren't allowed to give an athlete uh, a scholarship for, to the school back then. That all changed in the 1950s. Uh, but in addition to the scholarship, which is a form of compensation, uh, 
many athletes are also on Pell Grants, which is a $6,000 stipend. Uh, athletes are, receive money under the table. They, the NCA approves gifts for the athletes that could m amount to more than $10,000. So there are lots of ways, not necessarily adequate ways, but there are still lots of ways that athletes are paid, uh, and to call them amateurs is, ju is, is just very misleading. So one of the questions I have about pay for play is, what will the rules be? Are you going to have an open market? You know, if you look at all the professional sports, there are constraints on the markets. Players can become free agents, but teams have salary caps, or teams have luxury taxes, or teams have debt limits, or teams have revenue sharing. There are all sorts of ways the market is constrained. How will the market function? Nobody has defined that. They just say, let's pay the athletes. Are you going to, are you going to have coaches go to the high schools of America? Uh, and some, some coaches will show up from a Pac-12 school and some coaches will sign up, uh, end up coming from Wisconsin and, and Michigan and some will come from Virginia and they'll go to the same athlete and they'll, they'll bid against each other. Is that how you're going to do it? That would be an open market. Nobody has defined that and I think it's, it's potentially very disruptive and perilous. Uh, and there's also a question about what happens to the non-stars. What happened, and again, college football is 85 scholarships in, in FBS. Um, most of those kids are not playing on a regular basis, or if at all. An NFL, team's had, an NFL had team has 45 active players. An average FBS team has 85 scholarship players and 31 walk-ons. So they've got over 115 players on the team. Uh, what are you going to do to the players who are, you know, like the, the 80th best or the 70th best on the team? Are they going to get market wages too? If they do, it would be worth less than their scholarship. So that also has to be dealt with. Um, another question, of course, is where will the money come from? Programs now are in $14 million deficit on average. Where are you going to get the money to start paying the players? I think that there are some answers that we can talk about later, but I don't think any of them are adequate. Um, all right, enough, enough of pay for play. We'll, we'll come back to it. Uh, the Rice Commission, Condoleezza Rice, former um, Secretary of State, um, was, was asked by the NCAA uh, to run a commission to look at reforming basketball. This was after the FBI had identified the, this network of, of recruitment that I talked about earlier. Um, so what did the Rice Commission come up with? They studied the, stu they studied the issue for over a year. Uh, they came up with a, a couple of recommendations. One of them uh, was to allow players who entered a professional draft to go back to college. That has not been the case. But if, you're, if, you know, if you were um, a player who had been in, in basketball and college basketball for a year and you entered the NBA draft or you'd been in college football, if you'd been in college football for three years and you entered the NFL draft, once you entered the draft, the NCAA would not let you return. So if you, got, if you got picked by a team you didn't want to play for, or if you didn't get picked at all, they considered you a professional. You, weren't, you were tainted now, tainted goods, and you couldn't go back to college. So they said, that's silly, let's, let's end that. That's, that was a good idea to do that. Uh, it hasn't been implemented yet, but it's, it's being discussed. Uh, it also, they also recommended that you should allow college athletes to get advice from lawyers or agents before they enter the draft. If in the old days, well, it's actually still the case, the system has operated for a long time. It says, you want to enter the, the NBA draft or the NFL draft? You can't go to a professional to ask how you can prepare yourself for the draft, how you sign up for the combine, uh, uh, what, 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 how much will you get paid if you get drafted in the first round or the second round, what kind of rights will you have. College athletes were not allowed to go to agents or weren't allowed to go to lawyers to discuss those things because once you did, the NCAA <laughs> said, you're, you've crossed the line, you're no longer an amateur. Uh, the, the Rice Commission said that, that you should do away with that. They should be able to talk to, um, should be able to, talk to, to uh, professionals. Both of those good ideas are good. There are a couple of other small ideas like that. They want to end one and done uh, for basketball players. We can talk more about that. That's also, I think, a good idea. It was a bad idea to introduce it in the first place. I was at the bargaining table when it was introduced. It was a, it's a phony idea. It was never intended to, to promote education. Uh, so there are a lot of nice ideas that come out, but it's also, uh, it's all incremental and it's all piecemeal, all of the ideas from the Rice Commission. Uh, they say, have nothing to say about uh, controlling coaching salaries. Uh, they have nothing to say about special admission standards for athletes or phony curricula. 
um, that are put together for athletes. Uh, they say nothing about, and since this is, this is um, March Madness time, I want, I want to emphasize this. I don't know if you know this or not, but when a team in the men's tournament wins a game, the NCAA gives $265,000 to the conference that the team comes from. Each time they win a game, 265,000. So that means you can get, uh, you, you get about $1.5 million for each tournament. And that $1.5 million is then given again for five consecutive following years to the conference. Uh, so that it's actually, actually worth somewhere in the neighborhood of $7.5 million on the men's side if you go all the way to, to the final four. How much do you think you get paid on the women's side? Nothing. When women win, win a game, they get zero. I, that's pretty strange, right? Because I mean, usually what you hear as a justification for, for men getting paid more than women in sports is that the men generate more revenue. More people will watch the men's games on television or more go, go to, the, to the games uh, live or wh what have you. But here's a case where it's very clear. The women's games sell out. They sell out the arenas in, in, in March Madness. Women's games are watched on television, not by as many people, but in part because the media doesn't cover it. But there's certainly revenue being generated. How can they get nothing? Well, anyway, the Rice Commission says nothing about that and some other things as well. So let me in, instead uh, turn during my final uh, minutes here uh, to what that what I recommend and what a group that's known as the Drake Group recommends as a reform path uh, for, for college sports. Back in 1984, the Supreme Court uh, ruled against the NCAA in an antitrust case. And what they said basically was that there are certain things that the NCAA controls that are educational and it's okay for them to control them. We won't hold them uh, responsible for uh, antitrust violations when, when it's educationally oriented. But there are other things like a national television contract uh, and perhaps controlling coaches' salaries or other things which are economically motivated and they're going to be held responsible or they're going to be held accountable to the nation's antitrust laws. Uh, and, and because of that ruling, what's happened in the last now 35 years is that the NCAA is brought, uh, brought up against some antitrust claim practically every year, and some, some years more, uh, more than one antitrust claim comes every year. And those claims cost a lot of money. The, the O'Bannon ca case, which the NCAA lost ultimately, uh, cost over $100 million to the NCAA to, to prosecute that case. Um, so I, I think that what, what needs to be done is for there to be public legislation public policy set in Washington that stipulates a conditional and limited antitrust exemption for the NCAA so that they would not be subject to these antitrust claims anymore, which, by the way, though, when, when there's an antitrust suit, what happens is that the district court judge passes some judgment on it, and the judge, district court judge gets to play Solomon and decide what the NCAA can do and what they can't do. The district court judge doesn't have to be a sports expert. Uh, they're just a legal expert. And they, they define what the parameters or the institutions are going to be. Once they do that, the suit is almost always appealed, and it goes to the, the regional court of appeals, uh, and they could decide something else. And ultimately, it can go to the Supreme Court. Um, and each of, the, each of the 12 circuits, the judicial circuits in the United States, could, could have different results, could have different findings altogether. So it creates a lot of chaos. It's a lot of money being spent, and it's people who are not experts in sports or the economics of sports, making decisions about what the institutional economic structures of, of college sports should be. Should be. So what, what I am proposing and what the Drake Group is proposing is that, that the, the Congress establish a commission to look into all this, and the goal would be to have a conditional antitrust exemption so that the NCAA wouldn't be subject to these suits, and it would be that conditionality would be subject to the NCAA beginning to actually implement the educational priority or prioritization that it talks about in its charter and it talks about in its, in its constitution. So that they would be required to oversee that, the, that universities actually carry out the mandates in, in the medical mandate uh, or the medical um, publications that the NCAA puts out. And they would be required to 
actually have e enough individuals at the NCAA to oversee what's happening academically and to make sure that there weren't uh, phony, phony curricula being, being followed by the athletes and to make sure there weren't special admission standards and so on. So that you could, in, in, one, in one blow, through the antitrust exemption uh, and, and through a bunch of measures that would dictate an adherence to academic integrity. And at the same time, another requirement would be that the student athletes have to be taken care of properly. Right now, there is no program in the NCA that requires schools to provide medical insurance uh, for the athletes, to, to pay for that. The athletes have to have medical insurance, but sometimes they get it by paying for the college program, and sometimes they get it through their, their parents, their family program. Uh, and the extent of coverage that they get is inadequate. So another set of requirements would have to be that the NCAA enforce proper treatment for the medical care of, of the athletes. The NCAA would also be required to allow athletes to earn money through their, through their nil, uh, through their nils and er earn money through other vehicles. Right now, college athletes cannot use their athletic skills to work at summer camps and earn money in the summer. So you could identify a whole slew of different things that the NCAA has done to, to hurt the, the position and the experience of college athletes and force them to undo that if they wanted to have their antitrust exemption. Uh, so that's the basic idea of, of uh, the changes. I, I think that what we're seeing in, in the last couple of years in Congress is increasing interest in it. There are a lot of state legislatures that are, that are passing laws um, that open up the, the college, college labor market and require uh, certain adherence to, to norms of, of academic integrity. There are people in, in the National Congress, I just mentioned earlier uh, Senator Murphy from, from uh, Connecticut, who are beginning to talk about sponsoring legislation. The Drake Group that I'm working with is helping some of the, the legislators uh, write some of that legislation. Um, I think it's very important. You know, the, the, the NCAA, which has been around since 1905, has been up against criticism that crops up every five or ten years about, about academic misdeeds, about paying athletes under the table, about corruption. Uh, there have been numerous commissions, um, and each time that they're, they're up against those kinds of pressures, what they do is they tweak their system a little bit, but they maintain the basic dynamic. Of, of the system. It's never really changed. The NCAA is structured in such a way that it's managed by and run by athletic directors from schools, coaches from schools, and conference commissioners. It's not in their interest to really reform the system. They're the key beneficiaries of the system. So what I think needs to happen is to have public policy address, address these questions. The NCAA is not going to solve the problem on their own. They've been given lots, of, lots and lots of opportunities and decades and decades to do it. They haven't done it. Public policy can do it. The Association for College Presidents, ACE, could do it. NGB, the National Governing Boards Association, uh, which is the association of, of trustees and, and regents from around the country, they could do it too. But it's not something that an individual college president can do. It's not something that an individual college can do. An individual college is subject to the systemic forces uh, that they, they're surrounded by. So WSU is forced, if they're going to play the competitive game, if they're going to stay in, in the Pac-12, they're forced to pay the coaches, whether it's four million or three million or some other number, uh, they're, they're forced to do that. Uh, the, the way the problem can be solved is not by WSU taking the matter into its own hands. What we need is national legislation. And I think with that, I'll stop and take any comments or questions you might have. Thank you very much. So we have about 20 minutes or so for Q&A, and I'm going to ask you if you have any, a question you'd like to ask to go to either side. There's a microphone, and uh, just stand behind there, and we'll alternate. We'll go back and forth between them. Maybe I'll start off our questions. Um, so, 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 I, so I get it. We need public policy. Um, how's that likely to occur, absent some kind of leadership from university presidents or something from outside? Because it's, it's not likely just to right. spontaneously occur inside right. legislatures or Congress, right? Right. So. Yeah, so that's a good question. And uh, the answer is political, which means I, as an economist, have nothing to do with it. 
Uh, no, but I look. What's happening today is that college athletic programs are running larger and larger deficits, uh, and they're getting themselves in more and more uh, trouble with academic integrity, and more and more trouble with abusing athletes. Um, and the deficits are growing. Uh, they're going to grow more because of pressure for, for rising costs with, with, with regard to paying the athletes. Uh, they're going to grow more because of the costs related to uh, changes in the tax code that I discussed. And college presidents who were unwilling to get engaged in the process of reform 10 years ago, because basically it, college presidents have a lot to do, right? They have a lot on their plate. Uh, they've got to raise money for the school. They've got to worry about the physical plant at the school. They have to worry about attracting good faculty, attracting good students. They have to worry about the internal dynamics at the school and keeping peace. Uh, and college presidents don't really have the time to focus on athletics. There have been a few college presidents over the years who have been, outra been outraged by what happens in college athletics and have tried to reform it. Uh, and they've either gotten fired or they've had their wings clipped by the, the Board of Trustees. Uh, it doesn't work when an individual president does. So yeah, it, what has to happen is there has to be a critical mass of college presidents who begin to talk to each other through the national organization of college presidents or college trustees through the national governing, governing board, uh, the NG, NGB, um, to, uh, to begin to pressure legislatures, legislators. Uh, and that is beginning to happen. I don't think it's happening yet at, at a critical level, the level that it needs to happen at. But there are lots of legislators who are looking at the, the economics of college sports and looking at the scandals in college sports and saying it's time to act. And so, as I suggested, um, there are some bills that are sitting around in the National Congress. There are a bunch of bills that are in different state legislatures. And so this is, process is building momentum. It's, it's, it's not necessarily going to lead one, one, to one place or another, uh, but it's something like most legislation that if you want it to happen, you have to work on it. So I have another question for you then. <laughs> so, um, so removing the the uh, antitrust um, uh, conditions applied to, to NCAA sports, that would presumably allow the NCAA to impose uh, caps on how much could be spent on, in, in different sports. Um, how would that process take place? Because I, I can imagine, you know. College football, men's football, would uh, want very large caps on how much could be spent on their programs, and, and women's sports may get very, very little. So, so how does that? How would you envision that process taking place? All right. So first of all, yes. Let me. If if I weren't wasn't clear earlier, it's an antitrust violation for different producers to come together. In this case, different colleges coming together through the NCAA coming together and saying you can't pay people more than a certain amount. The NCAA tried to do that in the 1990s. Uh, there was something called the, uh, the, the law case, the LAW case, it wasn't, the law, law was somebody's name. And what, what the NCAA tried to do is to cap the payment of the third basketball coach <clears throat> at $12,000 per school year. And the, the third basketball coaches got together and they went to, went to some antitrust lawyers and they sued the NCAA. And the court said, yeah, the NCAA is guilty here. You can't do that. You're not allowed to set a cap. This is a market system. This is supply and demand operates. If you try to interfere with supply and demand, um, you're violating antitrust laws if you're doing it by coming together through an organization. You can do it as an individual school. An individual school can decide they don't want to pay the third basketball coach more than $12,000. But to get together and collude with other schools, or in this case, the NCAA, that's an antitrust violation. So yes. if people wanted to set some limit on college, head college coach salaries, whether it's $500,000 or some other number, the NCAA would need an antitrust exemption. And it's the same thing for other costs. To be able to, con to control how much could be spent on facilities, you need an antitrust exemption to do that. And that that's the basis of, of the conditional antitrust exemption I was talking about, uh, which is to say, you do these things to cover, to cover your, your positions academically, you do these things to treat the athletes properly, and we'll give you a conditional antitrust exemption. The purpose of that is to be able to control the cost. Now, Cornell asks a good question. 
how are you going to get the coaches uh, and the athletic directors who hire the coaches, and every time coaches' salaries go up, athletic directors' salaries go up, because the athletic director becomes more important. If the athletic director is employing a coach at $4 million, that athletic director becomes more important to the university than if the coach is paid $500,000. So how are you going to get coaches and athletic directors who fundamentally, with conference commissioners, control the NCAA and decision making, how are you going to get them to impose a limit? And the answer is you're not. Um, and that's why I said you, we can't rely on the NCAA to bring about meaningful reform and why it has to, it has to come from public policy. So it would have to be part of, of the public policy initiative to stipulate that there would be certain limits in how much you can pay uh, coaches and, and other personnel in the athletic departments. question, but um, time, but I'll ask one. Um, you, talk, um, you talk about sort of the impacts as this sort of amorphosis of universities, um, but one of the concerns obviously a school like WSU has is the dispersion of resources across all of the FBS. And I often say that we're in an arms race and we're the Soviet Union, and we all know what happened to them. Um, uh, we're the lowest, you know, you know we have the lowest budget. You're even more pessimistic than I am. <laughs> yeah. But I'm wondering if that, if that will eventually evolve, you know, to the situation where um, we're run out of the, we're run out of the, uh, out of the consortium here, or that there'll be just a smaller number of, players, or Alabama and the others will just break off and do their own thing because they don't need the NCAA. Yeah, that's, been, that's interesting. That's been a threat, actually, that, that's, that's popped up over the years um, where the NCAA began to discuss legislation to curtail the advantages that the big schools had. Uh, and the big schools, back in the late 70s they, and early 80s, they formed something called the, the College Football Association. Um, and they, they said to the NCAA, look, you, if, you, if you control us too much, we're just going to break off and we'll, we'll do our own thing. We don't, have to, we don't have to submit to that. Of course, the, the, the big time schools have a lot of advantages being part of the NCAA. One, one of the advantages is that they uh, don't have to um, pay their players and they, and they can claim that their, their, their players are amateurs, but if they break off and become more commercialized than the NCAA without the rules that the NCAA has, they, they might have to start paying their players. They might have to start paying payroll taxes. They might have to start buying uh, workman's compensation insurance and so on and so forth. Uh, so there has been that threat uh, over time. Uh, I don't think that it's, it's something that is being actively actively discussed at this point, but I do believe that if the Alston and Jenkins plaintiffs won the, the, the case um, in, in California and Oakland that was just happening, uh, and if it was upheld by the Ninth Circuit, and if it was upheld by the Supreme Court, all of this would take a long, long time. But if all of that happened, and, and what you, you had was a more open labor market, and so colleges competed against each other to, to get players, and they would offer the players more and more money, I do believe what would happen eventually is that you would find that college sports began to resemble, in, in their size, professional sports. So you'd end up with 32 college uh, football programs uh, that, that played at this level of, of um, pay, paying college athletes money, and you'd end up with 30 basketball programs, because there are 30 NBA teams doing that. Um, and what, what might happen you know, after, after 10 or 20 years is that each of those programs would become a minor league for the, the major league team in the NFL and the NBA. And that, after all, would not be such a, a, a bad outcome. But I think you'd go through a couple of decades of turmoil and a lot of economic and financial pain at all the other colleges. Um, and one of, you know, one of the interesting things here is, is that if you look at Major League Baseball, which had its opening day today, each team in Major League Baseball, on average, spends about $30 million on its minor league system. Right? They, have, they have six minor league teams, each major league team has six minor league teams. The major league pay team pays the salaries of the minor league players. They pay the salaries of the coaches. Uh, they have scouting divisions that they have to pay for. Basically, all of that work in football and basketball is done for them by the colleges. Colleges um, are function 
as minor league systems for the NBA and the NFL. Actually, they're better than minor league systems because they're covered nationally. So they end up, when, when, when somebody gets drafted by an NBA team, like Zion Williamson uh, will be, he's, he's a star. Everybody knows about him already. And so if he goes to the Knicks, more people will go to the Knicks games or more people will go to the Golden State Warrior games or whoever, ever, wherever go, go, Zion Williamson ends up playing. Um, and, and, and so one, one of the fixes, and it, it's not a fix that, that public policy can control because it has to do with the private sector. One of the fixes to, to this problem might be that the, the NBA is forced to subsidize or take on as minor league teams 30 different colleges around the country. And the NBA, same thing, 32. Uh, how, how you would get there is, is, is more complicated, but it would be an interesting way to resolve the, some of the financial dilemma that exists right now. No students have any questions for me. Everybody agrees completely and understands completely what I said, right? Richard, there's gonna be an exam tomorrow, is that right? Absolutely. <laughs> All right, okay. if there's no more questions, then uh, I, you must have answered everyone's questions. <laughs> that rarely happens. So, uh, so let me, uh, on behalf of the Foley Institute, thank all of you for coming out today, and join me now in thanking Professor Zimplis for a really interesting conversation. Today.